each of our um, expert panelists is going to speak uh, seven to eight minutes about, uh, 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 about their different topic. Uh, Stephanie Scott will be speaking on an overview and the role of the agencies. Dr. Mark uh, Leandris is going to be speaking about the, the first part of the medical process. And Dr. Saeed uh, Danishman is going to be speaking out about the second part of the medical process. Diane Hinson is going to be speaking more in detail about the legal considerations, and Deb Levy is going to be speaking about relationships and psychological aspects uh, uh, of this journey. So I'm going to sort of sit back, and the last 10 minutes uh, of, the, of the program, we're going to take questions. I'm sure we're going to have questions. Um, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over, and, and uh, if we can go ahead and start with you, then that would be great. We'll go right down the line, take your eight minutes, and okay. we're off. Hi, I'm Deb Levy, and um, I'm talking about the psychological aspects of surrogacy. Um, in order to tell you a little bit more about that, I want to tell you about myself. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor, marriage and family therapist, and I came to surrogacy very accidentally. Back in the 90s, I had a private practice, and more and more of the couples that were coming to talk to me were coming to talk about fertility-related issues. And so, honestly, I didn't know much about it at the time. I joined the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and learned as much as I could about donor egg and surrogacy and infertility counseling. Well, in the literary world, we call that foreshadowing because then my husband and I had our own experience with infertility, and ultimately I had my children through surrogacy. And one thing that I learned about the industry is that the doctors knew the medical piece and the lawyers knew the legal piece, but there wasn't a lot of emotional support, someone to put it all together for me, and I didn't know what I didn't know. So what I want to teach you is just a little bit about how to mitigate the emotional roller coaster that can come with surrogacy. So one thing that I think is really important is just to talk about what emotions there may be. Obviously, there's excitement. We're all excited about making babies. That's why we're all here. We're passionate about it. There's also some fear. There's fear of the unknown. There's fear of what is she going to be doing? You know, well, there's fear of what if it doesn't work? And then there's fears of I'm not in control. I'm not the one driving the bus. You know, and that's something that I think is really important to note is that you do have a sense of control. You can control who you work with, who you create your team baby with. That's the thing that you can control. But you're right, once someone else is carrying your baby, this very precious cargo, you have to let go of some of that control, which can be scary. There's a story that my girlfriends tell all the time that, um, they, that will hold me to my grave sometime. Um, oh, I was going to visit my surrogate who lived in Pretty Prairie, Kansas, a town of about 400 people. And we were driving from Denver, and it was about a seven hour drive. I was bragging that I got there in six. And we got there to visit my surrogate, and she was taking us for a ride on the back country roads of Pretty Prairie, Kansas. And I could not believe how fast she was going. And I was holding on to my seat, and then I was complaining to my girlfriends afterwards, I can't believe how fast she was driving with my baby. They reminded me that I was bragging about getting there in six hours before then. So you have to let go of some of that control. Some of the things that maybe you would do yourself, someone else is doing also. Um, Sometimes there's anger that goes along with surrogacy. There's anger that it doesn't work. There's anger that you have to do it in the first place. There's anger when you are trusting people that maybe shouldn't be trusted. You know, that, that's a part that is okay to be angry about. You know, it's sad to see that some people are misled in this industry. And it's important to trust people that you work with in the industry, but whether it be the agency, the physician, the attorney, or your surrogate. But anger is a natural piece of it. One thing that we can do is we can manage expectations. I think that's a really important thing to do to mitigate the emotional roller coaster. So one thing that we can do is be proactive. Talk with your partner about what it is that you're looking for in this experience, and then create a team of people that share your values and share your expectations. Talk about how many embryos you want to transfer. Talk about things like how you feel about multiples what you feel about selective reduction or even terminating a pregnancy that is not normal. 
being proactive and finding people to work on your team can create more of a level playing field. Of course, we're still gonna have an emotional roller coaster. Things can come up. I remember with my second surrogate pregnancy, we were so excited, we found out we were pregnant. Disappointed when we found out the hormone levels were low. Excited when we found out it was a twin pregnancy. Disappointed when we found out that we lost one. There's a natural emotional roller coaster that goes with this. And we have to buckle up and go for a ride. We can't control every aspect of this. But again, mitigating your expectations, looking at how we can perceive this so that we're not necessarily going on that emotional roller coaster is going to help. Think about how you can feel comfortable with who you're working with, where you are, and that will allow us then to ride the ride and let it be maybe a smoother ride. You can't separate the emotions out from the surrogacy process. You just can't. So I want you to think about this. They say it takes a village to raise a baby. It takes an army sometimes to create it. Create your army with people you trust, with people you want to work with, with people that share your values. Think about that. Enlisting a counselor to help you talk about these things is always recommended. Think about things that maybe you've never thought about. What might trigger your sense of feeling out of control? What might trigger your sadness or anger? Let's talk about all those things so that we can sit back and enjoy the pregnancy and enjoy the surrogacy. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Hi. So um, in this short time, what I thought I'd do is I'd give you five tips for um, a smooth surrogacy journey and then just touch to, um, quickly two recent laws that could affect um, the surrogacy ride. Okay, so first tip it would be, um, and these are no particular order, I'm not doing it like David Letterman, um, minimize the bumps in your journey um, by having an attorney involved right from the beginning. Um, because as I, I mentioned earlier, legal issues are going to come into a step every, are going to come into play every step from the, from the matching um, up to the fact that you're going to need to go to court to establish your rights to be the to be the legal parent, uh, you just you can't do it yourself. You're going to need legal counsel. So um, just make sure that you you get you get someone involved early. You don't want to get matched to someone and then later find out that she's in a state where you can't establish your legal your legal rights. Um, and that leads right into tip number two, which is work with a surrogate who lives in a state that lets you establish your parental rights. That's particularly important for any of you who live right here in New York because surrogacy is against public policy in New York. So what you need is a uh, surrogate who lives in a state that's both what we call surrogacy friendly and gay friendly. Um, and if I were in your shoes, what I'd want is a, if you're a couple, um, I'd want some place where, um, well, for any of you, I'd want a place where you can get a pre-birth order um, that names that, that declares that you are the sole legal parent, and if you're a couple, I'd want it to declare that you're both legal parents. There are enough states like that, and then you both go on the birth certificate immediately. Now, there are hundreds of variations of surrogacy laws that exist. Um, some are in statutes, some are published in case laws, others are in these sealed cases. Whatever law you, case you have, it's going to be sealed to protect the privacy, and so. Um, why is this? Well, there is no federal law in this country, and um, the courts and the legislatures also apply different laws depending on who you are. Are you a straight couple? Are you a hetero couple? Are you married? Are you unmarried? Are you using um, the, the sperm and eggs that are entirely your own? Obviously, if you're a gay couple, uh, dads you can't be, or if you're dads or women, you can't be using both the sperm and the um, egg that are your own, at least not in 2013. Uh, so you need to, um, you know, you need to figure that out. There's also different laws depending on your, if you're using a gestational surrogate or a traditional surrogate. Traditional surrogate is where the surrogate is using her own eggs. My advice to you is if you're trying to minimize your risks, which I think everyone should be trying to do, your legal risk, use a gestational surrogate. Um, in some states, the, the result's gonna differ based on what county you're in. In some states, it's gonna depend on what floor of the elevator you get off on in the courthouse. Um, so don't be anybody's legal curve. You know, you need an expert attorney in this area. 
Um, there is a state map that you can go to. Um, it's actually on our website, or you can go to surreycmap.com, and um, I can talk to anybody more about that later. Okay, next is, so you find a surrogate, and you say, well, she lives close to a border. She can get over the border to have her baby. That's okay except for plan A, but plan B has to work too. So the problem is you, babies have a mind of their own. This is tip three. Tip three is make sure plan B also works. So if your surrogate lives in a state where it's not okay and your rights are not enforceable, you, she may not make it. She may have an emergency delivery and the, the ambulance may not cross um, over the line or worst case scenario, she may change her mind like that awful case in Michigan a few years. So plan A is okay as long as plan B works too. Remember, we're trying to maximize the chances that this is all gonna go smoothly and happily and have a happy ever after, after ending. Okay, tip four, and Deb mentioned this a little bit too, but it also hits on all the legal issues, which is make sure you and your surrogate are on, all, are on the same page on all the pregnancy issues the tough issues, um, and your agency or your attorney should lead you through all these discussions um, up front, but you should talk about them first, decide how you feel about them, and then you're gonna talk about them with your attorney, with your mental health worker. How do you feel about twins? How do you feel about genetic testing? What would you do if you had a baby that was showing, a fetus that was showing Down syndrome? What if you ended up with the split embryos and you needed selective reduction? If you don't know the answer to this, that's okay. You need a surrogate that says, well, I'm the babysitter, I would defer, but you need to think about this, make sure you're all on the, the same page because the flip side of Roe versus Wade is that there's no court that would force a woman to get up on a table and terminate a pregnancy. So you need to make sure that you're really on the same page. Even though you'll have a contract that says it's a breach of contract, you have to remember what what you can get out of it, money damages, but not an order for her to do something to her body. Um, fifth and last, um, you wanna develop a really good relationship with your surrogate throughout the IVF process and the pregnancy because this just reinforces everything that's in your legal contract. Um, the more she bonds with you, the more she just pictures that moment when you have that baby in your arms, the more that just reinforces everything and you can start to relax and stop worrying that you know she might change her mind. In fact, it's the surrogates who ask us a million times, well, how do I know that the parents won't change their minds? What if this baby is born with nine instead of 10 fingers? They are done with diapers, but we want you to reinforce it and really have a great relationship with her. So let me just quickly mention the two laws and you can talk to us later about them. So first is there's been the repeal of DOMA, yay, uh, or at least finding it um, unconstitutional. I'd say the biggest change is marriages are up and so are babies. You know the old ditty, first comes marriage and comes baby, so yeah. <laughs> there. And I think that's just fantastic that people are find building their families in whatever way is best. Um, also, the second is the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare as it's known, um, and the question is what will be the impact on surrogacy? One of the essential benefits, uh, health benefits under that is maternity benefits, um, maternity coverage. Now the question we've had from the beginning is will there be any exclusions? Will there be an exclusion for surrogacy? Because getting health insurance for surrogates has been a real issue. And the answer at this point is we're hopeful, but the terms and conditions of all the plans have not yet been available, like in all the, like in the 27 states where under, it's under the federal exchange. Um, even our health insurance expert that we're working with has yet to be able to get them. And when she asked the federal government, they, um, they were like, we don't know. So we're hopeful <laughs> that it will be, but we're working on that. So I wish I had an answer for you, but that's our hope. Um, that, that it will be. And so on that one, I just say stay tuned. I've been working with a lot of the LGBT organizations on this. I think if it is excluded, there'll be a lawsuit, and I think there should be. So thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, I think that we're gonna start with Dr. Leandris for the first half of the medical discussion. 
The, the reason why we're here today is self-education, choosing an IVF center, in vitro fertilization is, a, is part and parcel with the process that everybody needs to go through to build a family. And choosing an agency is a really important process to protect your rights and the rights for you to bring your child home. As far as the building blocks of this process, basically we need sperm, we need eggs, we need either a fallopian tube, which is what happens in the natural process, or an IVF laboratory. So basically embryos spend five days in the fallopian tube, or they spend five to six days in the IVF laboratory. And that's really the role of the IVF laboratory, to nurture a one-cell embryo to a five, to, for, to an eight-cell embryo to a 250-cell embryo. And we all did that. We all were embryos once, which is an interesting concept. Once you have an embryo, <laughs> Then they're going to go into healthy uterus, and Dr. Danishman's going to talk about that. So I'm going to talk about the sperm and the egg here. As far as egg donors, there's always a big question. How do you find egg donors? Well, egg donors are found either by advertisements on the web or regular published advertising. And egg donors are asked to fill out a questionnaire. Sometimes it's a short questionnaire. In our office, it's a 15-page questionnaire. And these questionnaires come in fast and furious, and the reality is, is 90% of them are rejected. They're rejected for many reasons. Maybe somebody is, has irregular menstrual cycles or has other gynecologic problems. Maybe they're too old. Most clinics have an age cutoff. Maybe they're too young. Some, most clinics won't use people less than age 21. Maybe they, are, they actually lived in Europe for more than six months, and our government has decided that because of the risk of mad cow disease, you can't use an egg donor who's lived in Europe for more than six months. The, the other things that rule people are, are their own medical conditions and their family history. And there's always a question, well, how do you know we tell the, they tell the truth on that? And you actually don't know. But for the 90% of people who got ruled out, it doesn't matter. They're out. So the 10% of people that get invited in, uh, in our office, it's about a four-hour appointment day. They go through medical screening, psychological screening, and nursing education. The medical screening involves a medical interview with myself or one of the other board-certified doctors in my office, and it focuses on do they know what they're getting into? Informed consent. We discuss with them, do you really understand that you're going to go through 10 days of fertility medicines? You might gain 5 to 10 pounds. There's a risk of bleeding and infection. There's a risk to your own fertility. And kind of say, if you're really just doing this because you know about the reimbursement, it might not be the best idea. We also ask all, our, all the egg donors, why are you doing this? You get three answers. They're all actually nice answers. I'm not using my eggs, and I want to help somebody else have a family. I have children and I want to help other people have a family. And I've made some decisions in the past, and this is a way that I can kind of balance the scales. And they're actually really passionate about this. By the time they've gotten to this step, they've completed so many steps and done so much homework, they're usually ready to go. But they're not ready to go until they do infectious disease testing, hepatitis, HIV, syphilis, and some other special FDA-required infectious disease testing, as well as we do check their genetics. So you want to know if your egg donor has a recessive disease like cystic fibrosis or thalassemia or sickle cell disease. Those things are all done up front in the medical visit. Hormonal assessment to affect, check their ovarian reserve. Not every 25-year-old egg donor is a good egg donor. Once we get done looking at two hormones called follicle-stimulating hormone, anti-malarian anti hormone, and their ovaries. The ovaries basically are the testes in the body, right? Well, ovaries are a little bit different than, than testes because Women made all their eggs when they were five months in their mother's uterus. And you can actually get a baseline kind of picture of how many eggs a woman has at the start of a cycle called a basal antral follicle count. And it's a powerful tool to, to assess whether someone would be a good egg donor. Urine drug and toxicology screening is done on that same day. So we're, we, I actually ask all of them, have you been to the dentist? Have you been to the doctor? Have you taken anything? Because it's going to show up. Um, as far as the, the next side here, the psychological assessment, that's really essential. We have two mental health care providers that screen our egg donors. They are asking the egg donors, do they know what they're getting into? How did they come to this decision? What other support structures do you have in place? They assess them for mental illness, also their emotional stability, whether they have a partner or not, and they're aware of it. They talk to them about the fact that there could be a child 20 years from now who actually wants to know more about their family history because there's known and anonymous donors. They also, they also give the donors a psychological test. It's called an MMPI or a PAI-1. And it's basically the same 10 questions, 30 different ways. It's a test for mental illness, depression, reliability. And that's the psychological screening part of this. 
Then the nurse walks in and says, you understand you're going to do shots. You have to return my phone calls. You're going to have multiple transvaginal ultrasounds. You're going to have a blood dry every time you come in. And if you don't follow these rules, you're not going to play through. And then they give them a hug and play the nice nurse as well. <laughs> the nurses are really the lifeline to keep the donors in the program. In fact, many donors in our program donate the maximum recommended by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine six times because they actually like the process and they like the contact with, with the office. They get taught to give injections. And then basically, we all talk. And that either leads to acceptance or rejection. Somewhere around 50 to 70 per 50 to 70 percent of the 10 percent get accepted. So out of 100 people, we might get five to seven donors that, that get accepted for different reasons. As far as the intended fathers, you guys, there's medical interview and testing on you. There's also psychoeducational psych oh, counseling. You're not, nobody's screening you to be parents. I tell everybody when I meet with intended parents that they should let it all hang out, ask any question they want and talk about their future together. This is very important. It's your time to basically work out some of the things that you might have, not have ever talked about with your partner. And identify and work with the agency. Some people try to do this without an agency. I really think that's a challenge. And there's lots of great agencies here. And you should make those connections here. As far as medical interview and testing, overall health assessment, go to the doctor. Get your blood pressure checked. Check your health. You need to be around for these kids for 25 years for their mental health so they can grow up. Medication review. If you're taking testosterone, you can't take testosterone. If you have a history of anabolic steroid use, if you're taking Propecia, some people are concerned about that. There's some high blood pressure medications you're not supposed to take. Infectious disease testing, same idea, hepatitis, HIV, syphilis. You're going to need a semen analysis. What is your sperm count? Sperm count assesses concentration, motility, and the percentage normal forms. It's usually two to three, two to five, three to five days of abstinence. I'm sorry, two to five days of absence in between. It's a three-month snapshot. You can actually make your semen analysis better with some things that you can change in your lifestyle. As far as we live in an age where hepatitis and HIV positive men can be intended fathers with special sperm screening and, and uh, clearing. This slide is complicated. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip it. But basically, these are all the things you need to consider as you pick out your egg donor. You can see there's everything in here from level of anonymity to whether she's donated before. This is the process. Basically, sperm mates egg, we make embryos, and then we have a day five embryo here that's transferred into the uterus and potentially assessed. At my practice, at many practices, we only do day five transfers because they're associated with the highest pregnancy rate. And they allow you to decide with a better kind of clinical judgment of whether you're going to transfer one or two embryos. And it's a big decision. Twins sound great, but twins have about a four to ten times higher risk of complications. And twins, even if they're healthy, represent a lot more work uh, on the other side. And they can be more complicated from an insurance point of view. As far as genetic testing, genetic testing is available now. So you can know whether your child has your, the embryo is at risk for downturn or a high risk for pregnancy loss. As far as for me, I mean, what made me passionate about this is this is how I've built my family. So I'm a gay man. I've also gone through two surrogacy journeys. And, and it's been a journey. So this is my family. This is my child. And I can speak to this directly. And it's actually been amazing. And it's really humbling to talk to you guys and encourage you to think about it. Because it is a dramatic change in your life for the better. We, based on this passion, we built out Gay Parents to Be to try to help people collect some of the medical information on the other side of the, the social and information on this. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for part two of the medical discussion, Dr. Danishman. Eight minutes. She was a great surrogate. But one of the things we always talk about, you want a surrogate who has good mental and good general health. You want a surrogate who is organized because there are lots of different appointments, medications, and these medications have to be taken at specific times. Lots of appointments that a surrogate has to make. So you want to make sure that you have a surrogate who is very organized, who is very compliant. And of course, one of the things that we always do is when our patients take profiles, who work with great agencies who take profiles, I always ask my patients, please let me know about the profiles. Email me the profile so I can go through them. And what I look for when I go through them is obviously we want to make sure that you have a surrogate who's had a previous delivery. Why? Because if she's had a previous normal de delivery without complications, that gives us a lot of information that she probably is going to have a much lesser chance of having any complications during pregnancy. We look at the body mass index. In other words, we look at their height and weight. Why is that important? Because 
in some patients, if the BMI is very high, then these patients, these surrogates, are going to have a higher risk of diabetes, higher risk of gestational hypertension, meaning high blood pressure that occurs during pregnancy. Well, diabetes and high blood pressure during pregnancy can then lead to potentially preterm premature delivery, and this is a major complication, especially when it comes to twins. Oftentimes, couples want to transfer two embryos, and of course, we transfer about 40% of our transfers are single embryo transfers. I would tell patients, well, you know, we have great pregnancy rates because we're very meticulous in picking our donors and our surrogates, and if you, if you don't want to have twins, then we really should transfer one. And we have still terrific pregnancy rates with a single embryo transfer. So what we want to do with the surrogate is that, especially if we're transferring two embryos, we want to minimize the chance of complications which occur with twin pregnancy. What kind of complications? Again, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and preterm delivery. As Mark said, these are increased uh, significantly. Their incidence is increased in patients, especially in, in twin pregnancy. We want you to go home with your babies, and we don't want them to stay in intensive care unit for a long time. So when our surrogates come in, initially, they've already had their psychological screening done. We organize that beforehand because we want them to pass the psychological test. We want to make sure that when during the psychological test, for example, some of the things that are, that are asked is what kind of family support they have, um, what kind of mental status they have. We want to psychologically help these surrogates because, again, this process is involved. It involves multiple different appointments. It involves being compliant with medications, taking it on time. There's a difference. If a surrogate takes her progesterone injection 12 hours later than when she's supposed to, that affects our pregnancy rates. And so what we want to do is we want to maximize the chance that this is going to be successful the very first time. Then after the psychological screening, the surrogate comes to our office and spends several hours in our office. And during that time, what we do is we do an assessment of their uterus. We want to make sure that, for example, the uterus doesn't have any fibroids, any polyps, anything that could get potentially increase the odds of complications during pregnancy or decrease the odds of pregnancy when you transfer one or two embryos back in. So we do a procedure called a sonic histogram where we put some fluid into the uterus. And that, what that fluid does, it opens up the cavity of the uterus and allows us great visualization into the side of the cavity so we can make sure that there's no fibro, there's no polyps. Again, when you transfer an embryo back in, it's almost like a seed that goes into a flower bed. You want to make sure that that flower bed is perfect for that uh, uh, seed to germinate. We also want to make sure that the surrogate is healthy in terms of infectious disease. So during the time when she's there, what we do is we do blood screening for all the infectious diseases. But what's also important is to get blood screening for other parameters. For example, we do blood screening for fasting blood sugar insulin levels. We do a test called the hemoglobin A1C. We want to make sure that the average blood sugar over the last three months has been normal. Because you can have a, a blood sugar that's normal now, but what has it been on average in the last three to four months? Again, surrogates who have high blood sugar or high hemoglobin A1C are higher risk for having gestational diabetes. Uh, and of course, gestational diabetes complicates the pregnancy. If the surrogate has gestational diabetes, develops diabetes during pregnancy, there is a two-fold increased risk, two to three-fold increased risk of congenital abnormalities. So again, the, 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 the reason we want to make sure the surrogate is healthy is we want to maximize the chance of a healthy baby healthy babies, as the case may be. We also have the surrogate in our office meet with our nutritionist. As someone said, nutrition is extremely important during pregnancy. Why? Because there's a whole area of science called epigenetics, which means that environmental factors have a significant impact on genetic factors, on, on genes. So during the cycle, during the time when she's pregnant, and even before she's, she's pregnant, we want to make sure that she's meeting with a nutritionist I mean, our nutritionist keeps in contact with the, the surrogate throughout the pregnancy. We, our nutritionist actually keeps in contact with most of our patients throughout the pregnancy. So we want to make sure that she continues to exercise during pregnancy, to, to have a healthy diet, because that has a big impact, again, on minimizing complications during pregnancy and maximum, maximizing the health of pregnancy as well. And also, we have a, a great team uh, in place, and, I, and I, can't, I can't do any of this, we can't do any of this without our team. And the surrogate meets with our team of donor sur surrogate coordinators. And I get a lot of feedback from my donor surrogate coordinators. I really trust them in terms of their assessment of the surrogate. We want to make sure, again, somebody who's mature, somebody who has a, uh, a very organized plan, somebody who's compliant. The other factor that I, that I mentioned was 
a previous history of a delivery, meaning a previous history of, of having a preferably a vaginal delivery, but even if it's a C-section, what we do is we obtain their medical records from their um, obstetric history. Why? Because again, we look at their medical records to make sure that during pregnancy there weren't any complications. Certainly we, we can rely on the history of the surrogate you know, telling us, but I've had cases where I've looked at obstetric history and the surrogate had high blood pressure during pregnancy. Of course, again, that has an impact on your child, that has an impact on pregnancy, and our goal is to get the surrogate through pregnancy and minimize the chance of complications. There were some questions today that I had about a process called PGS or genetic screening. Should I do genetic screening on my embryos or embryo before I transfer the embryo back in? Well, the answer to that is a little bit more complicated. Not, it's not absolutely necessary to do genetic screening or what we call pre-implantation genetic screening before you transfer the embryo back in. Because oftentimes it's done for a risk of chromosome abnormalities such as Down syndrome or trisomy 18. The risk of those abnormalities during when you use an egg donor is very, very low. It's not zero, it's very low. And certainly it's your choice whether you want to do it, but what I do with my patients is I counsel them as to the benefits and the risk of doing uh, genetic screening. Certainly if you have an inclination to having one you know, baby, either male or female, certainly that's something done with PGS as well. Uh, but really PGS is, is usually uh, reserved for screening out chromosomal problems. So another thing that I do with both the intended parents and also the surrogate is sit down with them at length and talk about the genetic screening and talk about some of the things that are available during pregnancy for screening. For example, these days, in the last couple of years, there are several companies now that have that offer technological uh, ways of assessing the, 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 the pregnancy at 10 weeks of gestation to make sure that there's no chromosome abnormalities. For example, with the T21 test, it's a non-invasive test that's done at 10 weeks. We draw blood from a patient, from a pregnant mother, because we typically have the uh, surrogate go to the OB and we usually uh, monitor with their local OBs. And at 10 weeks of pregnancy, if the intended parents wish, you can get a, a genetic analysis at that time to rule out chromosomal abnormalities such as uh, trisomy 21 and trisomy 18. That's a lot better than doing the invasive testing called amniocentesis, which is typically done around 14, 16, 18 weeks of pregnancy. Of course, if anything is wrong at that point, it's a much more difficult decision yeah. for everyone, and also it's a much more complicated decision for everybody. So, thank you. And so, in sort of wrapping this up, I, I just wanted to make sure that you all know that the, the most important part of this, again, is just effectively communicating with your surrogates, with you, about all the options that are available to you. I think the more effective the communication, and in fact, the longer the communication, the more the communication, the better it is. You can't get enough information, and again, there's some incredible people here, clinics and, and agencies uh, with, with great histories, and, uh, and we really feel, again, that blessed to have an opportunity to be here and, and to help you become parents. Um, I do have a breakout session today, so if you have more questions about the process, please don't hesitate to come and ask me. Um, also, if you would like private consultations with us as well, I'd be more than happy to meet with you uh, later today. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Stephanie Scott. I'm the owner of Simple Surrogacy in Dallas, Texas. I'm here to talk about the role of the agency. Um, there are many different agencies, all are different. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how our process is from start to finish. So we're going to start out with the initial, initial consultation. When you first contact an agency, they're going to have you fill out a lot of paperwork. A profile is going to consist of um, what you're looking for in a surrogate, what your personality is like, what your, is your family um, connected to this, do they know about what your plans are. Um, also, what your stance is on things like selective reduction, termination, contact during, with, um, during your uh, process with your surrogate, not only during the pregnancy, but after the pregnancy as well. Um, let's see. Uh, with our surrogates, um, the first initial consultation is done um, with myself. Uh, I also, I'm very hands-on with my intended parents, as most agency owners should be. Um, you need to know who you're dealing with, know the intended parents, know the surrogate, know the donor. Um, you want to do criminal background checks on everybody that's going through 
whether it be the surrogate's husband, the surrogate herself, your donor, as well as the intended parents. Um, psychological evaluations, as everybody else said, are very, very important. Um, with us, we have three psychologists on staff alone, and two of them are former intended fathers that have been through our program. So when an intended parent comes to us and they have personal questions about, you know, well, how does, how does your child react? You know, do they know your surrogate? Do they know your egg donor? Those are also things that they can go over, you know, during, during the initial interview. Um, insurance review. Um, as Diane Henson said earlier, um, Obamacare or the Affordable Health Care Act is still kind of up in the air. We are, too, also working on obtaining some summary benefits from different insurance companies. Uh, different states have different insurance, um, basically, I don't want to say laws, but like in Texas, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Aetna, um, and some have exclusions and some don't. Um, if they don't have an exclusion, they're reviewed by a company called Art Risk. That's who we send all of our uh, basic summary of benefits and insurance overviews to. And they tell us what the risk is. Is this good to use for surrogacy or is it not? If there is no exclusion, the surrogates are happy to use their own health insurance, which actually saves you anywhere between fifteen and $45,000 on purchasing an insurance policy. Um, let's see. Go on to uh, making matches is uh, something that takes a little bit of time. Um, everybody has a match for themselves, you know, whether it be something you're looking for as far as little contact um, after the birth, or, you know, you may even uh, form a friendship with your surrogate during the process. A lot of our intended fathers are very close to their surrogates um, during and after. Um, these women are not there to um, be invited on vacation. They're not looking to come over and tell you how to parent your children. I've been a, a former surrogate myself twice. I'm still in contact with my intended parents. Uh, I still get pictures twice a year, but I do not intrude on their lives. I don't want to go on vacation with them. I don't want to babysit my surrogate baby. I just want to look at her from afar and go, oh, she's very beautiful, you know, and I, and I helped create that. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I've, I've made my family, as most surrogates have, these surrogates that apply with our agency on a normal basis have had two to three children, sometimes as much as six. Um, we don't like uh, to have them do too many surrogacies. I mean, I've had a few that have completed their families and said, I absolutely do not want to have another baby. And, you know, if they say that, then yes, we don't mind if they do a few surrogacies. But if it is a young surrogate mother and she has only had one child of her own, we would like her to keep her fertility. You know, surrogacy can be very dangerous on the body. There is a lot of medications involved in this. And I don't want a surrogate to come to me, carry a baby for somebody in this, um, in this room, and then have to use the surrogate herself five years down the line. So um, I think that that is very important. And the same thing goes with egg donors. If it's a young donor and she does not have any children, we don't want her donating six times um, because that's going to put her at risk to not be able to have a family of her own later on. And we definitely don't want that. Um, part of the matching process that we have with intended parents is we want you to be able to get along with your surrogate. We want you to be able to talk to her, have common interests. It gets very old having an intended parent call you and go, how are you feeling several times a day, you know, several days a week. Um, so you want to be able to, you know, go, how is your family? You know, what the kids do at school today? Um, kids are very involved in this, um, the surrogate mother's children, um, as well as their spouses. Um, my children knew all of my intended parents. Sometimes they came to ultrasounds. Um, you know, they were very excited for my intended parents. And in it, it really is a family thing. This is not just the surrogate that's involved, this is her entire family. Um, if she has a husband, we interview the husband. The husband has criminal background checks, psychological evaluations. We ask him what his stance is on things like selective reduction, termination. Um, also, what kind of contact he is hoping to have with the intended parents. I want to say about seven times out of ten, the surrogate spouse is kind of in the background a little bit. But at the same time, they want to know that their wife is being supported. They want to know that the intended parents are following through with the, uh, 
you know, just what they talked about initially. You know, if you tell your surrogate that you're open to communication after birth and that you're willing to send her pictures, then follow through with that because it, it can be very devastating for a surrogate to be shut out at birth. Um, you know, they're not looking to take your baby home, but at the same time, they just went through a very long process, just like you did, lots of injections, lots of emotions, and all they want to do is see your family grow. So um, I'm going to move on to uh, escrow accounts. A lot of people are interested in how to fund escrow, who to fund escrow with. Uh, my agency has its own escrow company. We have one um, escrow officer. Uh, it's licensed, bond, or I'm sorry, insured and bonded, as, as every escrow company should be. Um, you want to make sure that, um, well, the agencies are going to make sure that you fund escrow at contract signing. This is going to be your surrogate's base compensation as well as her anticipated medical expenses throughout the process. If she um, gets pregnant with twins, you're going to be putting her twin fee into escrow. We want to make sure that our surrogate's compensation is always in that escrow account. So if anything happens, she is going to be taken care of one way or another. Um, the escrow officers are bound by your gestational surrogacy agreement, so they will send out compensation um, just as it is lined or laid out in your contract. Most agencies are going to pay their compensation at 10% um, of the base compensation monthly starting at confirmation of pregnancy until after delivery. Um, usually there's one to two payments after delivery that are still um, kind of waiting in the wings. So once all paperwork is signed and everybody's at home with their baby, that's usually when the surrogates receive their last base compensation check. Uh, on top of this, there's going to be a monthly allowance. Um, ours is about $200 a month. This is going to cover your surrogates' mileage to and from doctor's appointments, prenatal care vitamins, uh, pregnancy testing supplies, um, any non-prescription medications that she may need, postage, out-of-state phone calls, um, it's uh, child care for day appointments, and so on. Um, the time frame to do a gestational surrogacy is going to vary by agency to agency. Um, I know that on the Men Having Babies website, there are lots of reviews as far as what the typical timeline is for each agency, what um, the average cost was through that agency. Um, so I would definitely look that up at any agency that you're going to go through. Um, Typically, with ours right now, I think we're averaging out about $85,000, and that's for surrogacy and egg donation in the United States, um, because most of our surrogates have insurance. Um, but it can go as much as, I mean, I've seen on the, uh, the reviews, as much as $170,000 um, with some agencies. So definitely look into them um, when you're looking at an agency and find out, you know, what they can do to keep costs down for you and what services they're going to provide you for that cost. Um, I think that's uh, that's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much.